Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, well, my name is Nancy Lindborg. I'm the president and CEO here at the U.S. Institute of Peace and delighted to welcome everybody here for uh, another of our bipartisan congressional dialogue series. Um, this is, a, this is a, an important platform for members of Congress who are working from opposite sides of the political aisle to advance their shared interests and common priorities. So I'm very pleased to welcome here today Congresswoman Davis, a Democrat representing California's 53rd district, and Congresswoman Martha Roby, uh, a Republican representing Alabama's 2nd district, uh, to discuss their shared interests uh, in democracy and human rights in Afghanistan. So it's especially fitting uh, that we're able to celebrate their bipartisan uh, spirit uh, because this is the same spirit that led to USIP's founding 35 years ago this week. We're celebrating our anniversary uh, of when Congress founded USIP to be a national, nonpartisan, independent institute dedicated to preventing, mitigating, and resolving violent conflict which we do around the world by linking research and policy training and support for those on the front lines of seeking to prevent and resolve violent conflict. And Afghanistan has been one of our top priorities uh, since 2002, and we've worked to build peace both from the top down and the bottom up, working with Afghan government, the U.S. government, civil society, women, um, and uh, today, Support to the Afghan peace process is a top priority for USIP. We have put considerable effort into supporting research, dialogue, skills building research, uh, workshops, and policy analysis, both here in Washington and in Afghanistan. We know from both research and conviction that for peace to be sustainable, it must be inclusive. Um, even since the Congresswoman's visit, uh, last visit in May, the situation in Afghanistan continues to be very fluid and very complicated. And we've seen that the peace process is now suspended. Afghanistan just had elections. Uh, the Taliban and Afghan government are in a military stalemate. ISIS and Al-Qaeda retain footholds in Afghanistan. And most of all, it's the Afghans, and it's the Afghan women and children who continue to suffer tremendously. So the need for peace is palpable. And whatever lies ahead, we know uh, that the way forward must provide both lasting security and preserve the hard-won gains. That's why this morning's conversation is so important. Congresswoman Davis and Congresswoman Martha Roby have played critical roles in ensuring that American policy focuses on, pr on protecting the gains for women and democracy in Afghanistan. And throughout their time in public service, they have been steadfast supporters both of U.S. service members in Afghanistan, particularly service women, as well as Afghan women. And together, they have uh, co-led annual bipartisan trips to Afghanistan every Mother's Day, uh, where they visit U.S. service members, they meet with Afghan women, including those service serving in the Afghan security forces and Afghan's parliament, and they were there again last Mother's Day. Um, throughout her work on the Armed Services Committee, uh, Congresswoman Davis has effectively led advancements for military families and service women, especially those stationed in Afghanistan. Congresswoman Roby similarly uh, is a committed champion for U.S. service members, uh, uh, particularly those stationed in Afghanistan. We are really fortunate to have uh, such committed members of Congress, and we're delighted to have them here with us today. Um, I want to quickly just note that we are very lucky to have three of our board members here with us, uh, Joe Eldridge, Judy Ainsley, and Steve Krasner in from California. Welcome. Um, and for those following the event online, especially those who are waking up early from the districts in California and in Alabama, um, I want to invite you to join the conversation on Twitter, at USIP, using the hashtag BipartisanUSIP. And with that, please welcome me in joining our two distinguished congresswomen to the stage. Need to start. <clears throat> Good morning. 
Good morning. It's so wonderful of you all to be here and, and join us. Martha and I love to talk about our experiences, and we're just delighted that USIP is bringing more attention uh, to this. And I know we have some wonderful folks in the audience who have been engaged in issues around Afghanistan for years, particularly in women's empowerment, and I'm delighted uh, to see all of you. I'm always honored to join Martha. Uh, we. We are from different political parties, of course, and different parts of the country. Uh, I could never get elected in Alabama, <laughs> for sure. I'm pretty I, sure I couldn't get elected so in California. Sure could, <laughs> I'm sure Martha would charm everybody in San Diego, but, but I think that there would be some gaps there. So, <laughs> uh, but but we certainly share common values of peace, women's empowerment, and the democratization of Afghanistan, and. And as you'll be able to tell, we really care a lot about each other. We really love each other. We've learned to just develop this very, very special friendship uh, over the years. Since 2007, on or around Mother's Day, as certainly uh, you've heard from Nancy, and Nancy, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I've led a bipartisan group of women's members of Congress to visit Afghanistan, and specifically to visit with our deployed mothers, because as you well know, there are many women who have been serving in Afghanistan, and the most amazing thing is to sit down with them and go through all the pictures of their very young children. Um, that there's not a dry eye at that time uh, meeting with them. But while we were doing that, um, we also um, were very focused on attending uh, shuras and, and really going beyond what we thought um, some members um, might have been thinking about. And of course, we started this rel relatively early. I actually got into the country earlier uh, than, than seven. I'm, I think one of the first took Codell's to go in, and as I mentioned in the questions, I happened to meet um, some women who had been part of the underground, really, uh, uh, with the Taliban, and, and they, they were so inspiring. Um, but we wanted to meet with everyday women who were doing incredible things, and so while we were Seeing our deployed mothers, we were including more and more Afghan women and going out to more remote areas, which is when we started going to Zabal province, uh, to being in, in Kulat, where we had a provincial reconstruction team, which was the reason that we were able uh, to go there, of course, because without security, they wouldn't let us in. Uh, and, and we began then seeing these incredible stories of resilience and triumph over adversity that so many of the women had experienced. So in recent years, we actually have not been able to travel outside of Kabul as much, although we, we had a little breakthrough last, uh, our last visit, um, but we, we still have found ways of hearing from women um, who are making a difference in serving their country in every imaginable way, in the government, in business, uh, working very, very hard, again, despite barriers to their engagement. We certainly were able to appreciate firsthand how vital it is that we empower young girls of Afghanistan to become leaders, particularly in national security, and that became a focus over the last number of years. From my service uh, and experience on the Armed Services Committee, I see that peace is also always better served when women participate and make decisions. And these trips, of course, inspired us, uh, and the women, again, were so inspiring that we began in the National Defense Authorization Act to put in um, some money uh, to f have funds to train and employ more Afghan women in the security uh, services. And we've seen We've seen great progress in that, um, but it's not without issues, uh, as you certainly know. Facilities that were earmarked for women, be, you know, have been taken over by men. Uh, initially, we, we saw that, and then even in our last trip, we were somewhat disappointed to see that they weren't able to quite have it work the way, the way we had hoped. Recruitment is still not where it should be. And of course, there's, there's violence. Uh, that many of the recruits face um, going um, back and forth, uh, even even from from their work. Um, but we wanted to keep pushing uh, on that as well. 
So uh, what now? Uh, last month, as you know, the U.S. Taliban talks were suspended. Many feared that the U.S. might leave Afghanistan with or without a peace deal. But I'm grateful uh, to hear just recently um, from uh, Ambassador Khalilzad that they continue to discuss ways to revive the peace process after talks had fallen apart. And my hope is that the Afghan government, and particularly Afghan women, are included, of course, in the dialogue as avenues are explored to satisfy major stakeholders. And I wanted to share with you, because I just came from a NATO um, parliamentary session meeting, and and there is a draft resolution on recent developments in Afghanistan. And initially, they were speaking about meaningful contributions by women. Um, that wasn't good enough. I wanted to be sure that they um, uh, said something about how important they are at the peace negotiation table. And so there is language that now says to do everything possible to ensure that Afghan women have seats at the table during peace negotiations and to support a final settlement that preserves the hard-won rights of Afghan women and girls. Yay. So that is part of the, Na the, the NATO parliamentary session. And I was happy to, to be there at that time. The other thing, just to share with you very, very quickly, um, there, I brought two little props here. Um, <laughs> one is a book called A Seat at the Table, Congresswomen's Perspectives on Why Their Presence Matters. And I just had to tell Martha that she's in the book as well. <laughs> and they actually highlight our trip in, in several different places. They talk about the fact that women have gone on this bipartisan trip, so that's exciting. And the other thing was that the um, with with um, Mrs. Ghani, there were a number of peace shuras um, throughout all of the provinces, and I, I have that book with me, I, and I have looked at this several times because when you think about these rural areas that women are living in and that they came together during this time and in the most eloquent way talked about how important peace is to them. It's quite moving, and um, I'm sure it's, it's available somewhere, but I wanted to bring it uh, with me today, and I look forward to uh, having the questions uh, from all of you. Thank you. Well, good morning. Thank you all for having me here this morning. My name is Martha Roby, um, and I proudly represent Alabama's second district. Um, throughout my time in Congress, I've had the privilege to serve on several committees that directly influence uh, this country's foreign policy initiatives, namely my first three years on the House Armed Services Committee with my friend Susan um, and the House Appropriations Committee um, for the last six years. Most recently, this Congress, I was asked to serve on the State and Foreign Operations Subcommittee on Appropriations. Um, in this role, I've been a part of many uh, negotiations regarding funding uh, levels for for the countless assistance programs uh, that we have overseas. Um, I've also used Congress's oversight, uh, congressional oversight power to question members of the executive branch about uh, the U.S. strategy abroad. And I believe uh, that process is important um, and we need to remain committed to upholding our own uh, democratic principles of checks and balances when making foreign policy decisions. Um, in addition to my official duties related to foreign policy for the past eight years, uh, my good, good friend Susan, and I can't say enough uh, about her, um, have led this all-female Mother's Day Codel to Afghanistan. Um, during these trips, we have been given uh, the opportunity to meet with our service women, as Susan has already um, discussed, who are away from their families on Mother's Day. And it is hard to talk about this without getting emotional, but when you look into these women's eyes um, as they are uh, serving our country and um, abroad, it's just amazing to hear their stories about their families. Um, so it's so important for members of Congress um, to see up close uh, our policy, how our policy decisions um, impact the lives of so many Americans at home and abroad. And I've been able to use what I've learned during these trips to make more informed decisions about military spending and defense policy. Um, but 
these trips also have afforded me the opportunity to reaffirm my commitment uh, to improving circumstances for Afghan women. Um, while gains have undoubtedly been made since 2001, it's critical that American leaders uh, remain engaged to ensure uh, continued forward momentum for these women. And it's my belief that a peace deal, a true lasting uh, peace in the country will not be reached unless all facets of the Afghan uh, community have a seat at the negotiating table. Um, so before I come sit down and answer your questions, I just want to take a moment to thank uh, the Institute of Peace for hosting this important and very, very timely uh, event at the time when the future in Afghanistan is uncertain. Um, these conversations are so important and I'm really honored to be a part of it. Um, I do want to say to my friend Susan, thank you so much. Um, you know, in, in this environment in which we uh, currently live, I think it's important for you uh, to see that there are true and real uh, relationships across party lines in the House of Representatives and in the Congress. And the relationship that I have with Susan is just that. It's real, um, it's sincere. Uh, when you travel with someone like Susan and I have, uh, when you go to uh, Kabul for the weekend together, uh, um, <laughs> multiple occasions um, uh, over Mother's Day or around Mother's Day, um, you not only learn a lot about each other in, in, in policy, but you learn a lot about um, our families and um, um, and just really have formed a real friendship. And so, if anything, we have lots of important things to discuss today, but if anything, I would like for all of you to leave encouraged <laughs> today, knowing that these relationships exist uh, in Congress and that they are very real and it's how we get things done. So again, thank you. I look forward to your questions and thank you, Susan, for, for including me today. Thank you both, and thank you for both reminding us and more importantly demonstrating uh, that spirit of bipartisanship. And I, so I want to start by, how many times have you traveled to <laughs> Afghanistan? Well, we started in 07 with a Mother's Day trip, and I believe I was there three times before that. Quickly, you know, as you know, we were never in country for, <clears throat> for that many days, but the initial one was, was fairly soon um, after we had gone into Afghanistan um, when they were still gathering um, men who could be serving in the Afghan army. A lot of them were Taliban, actually. They were bringing them from different areas. And at that time, I, I did meet some women who were working in the education underground, essentially, and, and they were, were so inspiring. And uh, I, I, th I think it, it, there had, had also been, uh, the speaker actually had, had been, and there, uh, you know, they had, had started some trips, and it just seemed to me that what we had to do was be, con con continue with those trips. And, and I remember our first time when we were in uh, Kula, just very briefly, I rem remarked, he said, well, we'll come back. And I remember the people who understood that uh, well and uh, kind of looked at me like, oh, sure. And, and at that point, I thought, no, we, we're really coming back. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was important to do that and to have a very strong statement uh, that, you know, we often say, we've got your back. I mean, we, we want to continue this relationship. So um, you can add them up. I, mean, I, I know. 12 to 15 I, decades. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> and when did you start the trip? So my first trip was in 2011. I was elected in 2010. And like I stated in my opening remarks, I was on the Armed Services Committee for my first three years in the House. And um, I remember getting the invitation, I, I believe it was Kathy McMorris Rogers came to me and said, um, I'm going on this trip and it's a bipartisan women's codel to Afghanistan and I really want you to go. And I remember discussing it with my staff and we all agreed it was very important. I needed, I needed to go and I think um, Team Roby was like, okay, well she needs to go and we'll do this, but you know, then we've been there kind of thing. Um, now here we are nine years later and um, I've been eight times with Susan every time and um, we, you know, I, it's, it's the thing I look forward to every year because I know I'm going to get to go. And I think the reason, and you heard Susan say this too, the reason I look forward to it is because 
we now know these individuals and they know we're coming and I feel like I would be letting them down if we didn't show up to say, again, we have your back and we're here to support you. And um, it really is the highlight of my year every year because it is so humbling to be with our men and women who wear the uniform uh, in theater to say um, we're for you and we appreciate you. Um, it's uh, equally as humbling to be with uh, particularly Afghan women who are on the front lines fighting for uh, human rights in, in their country. And it has just been one of the joys and blessings in my time in Congress. And um, I don't think you'll find two people who feel more passionately than Susan and I about um, our time spent in Afghanistan. So, so eight years, somewhere between <laughs> 10 and 12 years, that, that's a long span of time in a country that changes so quickly. What, what, talk about some of the changes that you've noticed through that span. And have you been able to go back? You, you mentioned you went to Zabul province. Were you able to go year after year? We, we initially we were, but after I believe five years, um, and I think there was a year in between there that we weren't able to go and then we got back. Um, we, as you, as you all know, I mean, the security situation changed primarily because the troops were no longer there and the numbers that were required um, to back up the provincial reconstruction teams. And the women have been, our, our troops have, have been part of that. <clears throat> and they had, and later, of course, they, they trained uh, to be part of the group that goes into villages and um, goes into houses, and they played a very in, important role then in speaking with the Afghan women who were there. And I'll, I'll never forget one of our Marines from Pendleton, um, who was very upset when the, the troops were pulled out, um, that they felt they had such an important role because they could calm down the situation a whole lot faster um, than a lot of our male troops were able to do because they were there to kind of, you know, <laughs> uh, knock doors down. And the women went in to calm the, the family and actually got the intel that was required to find out where, where the bad guys were, essentially, because they would come in. I, I love the story that, you know, and talk with, you know, through their translators and, um, you know, how, how did the kids do? How, how are the children? You know, what happened? You know, where were you? Do, you know, ask all those sensitive questions that, that help people relax for a minute and be able to relate. And so that's why we thought they were so important. But I think in terms of, of like, there, you know, we can go on and on, uh, but the stories, I, I do remember what the headmaster of the school who basically said, and this was by the, from the first time we went and then maybe the third time we went, she was still there. And, you know, she said, well, for, for a long time, because the children stopped coming to school because acid was thrown in their faces, you know, all the stories. And she said, you know, my, my, my fear, my concern um, for those first few years was always, you know, can I get enough students? And then her, last, her, her concern started being, can I find enough desks? And that a good problem. was a good problem <laughs> to have. So we saw that. We also saw the development of the help and support through midwifery uh, in the areas because women were just dying literally on the road because they, they might come in there and uh, maybe they weren't ready to deliver. They were sent back and they, they died. Uh, they had they had no help and no support. There weren't enough clinics. And in fact, I was just so dismayed when actually there was an attack recently in, in Kulat, and uh, they destroyed one of the clinics. And I mean, there were a lot of bad things happened. So that that was fairly recently. But we were able to see some of that transformation, and just the fact that we had all these women that would be around the table, um, and and so proud of of the fact that they had, they, they'd been given a small job um, that enabled them to change their status in their family. I remember this one woman was picking peanuts. Um, and she was, she was heavily covered and she, you know, she, it was just so surprising to have her speak up and tell us what had changed in her life 
for her kids. Um, so, you know, we would hear these stories. Were you able to meet the same women year after year? <clears throat> we have relationships with women that, you know, it d depends on how we're able to move about through the country based on the, the current security situation, but there are women that travel, in some cases, very long distances to come to uh, us. And, um, and that, again, is, is very humbling as well, but also demonstrates the importance of the relationships uh, with these women that we've, we've known from year to year to year. So we see familiar faces. There's, there's some women that we've seen consistently over the years. We also every year get to meet with, with new women that have emerged as leaders within their communities, um, which was really exciting in, in one of our visits. And I can't remember what year, um, <laughs> but we, uh, Ms. Ghani hosted us at the palace and she had um, several women, and actually they, they came back this last trip, <laughs> um, but she had started the, the Women's uh, Chamber of Commerce and these were women um, that were, had started businesses and they came uh, to meet with us with Ms. Ghani and um, it was really exciting to get to see particularly these very young women who had had, um, you know, joined the, the, the fight for all women in Afghanistan. Um, but just to build off what Susan was talking about a minute ago, you know, we've, we've been there at varying times, uh, surge, drawdown, and whatever is shaping here with U.S. policy uh, in Afghanistan has very clearly been demonstrated in the conversations that we've had with our Afghan friends when we we're in country. Hmm. Um, and I remember I, of course, was not on the first trip where they had the Shura in uh, in uh, Zabul province, but on my first trip, it was uh, the return, mm -hmm. and uh, we were able to go, and there were women that got there no matter what. They were going to be there, and I remember, and Susan, you jump in here if, if my memory's not correct, but my, my impression uh, that day was the in this room with, with the women and, and there were no men in the room and it was just us. And there was one uh, female parliamentarian <coughs> that was there. And I mean, we could barely get a word in. <laughs> it oh, yeah. was like, right. we got stuff, we have stuff to tell you and we need you to listen. And it, there was a real sense of urgency in that room. And I remember being really struck um, by that. And I think it's one of the reasons that I came home and said, I'm going back, and I'm going back every year, um, because I, I, I felt it in that room that day. And so Susan and I get together before every trip, because clearly what we're gonna be discussing while we're in country is very much dictated by what policies are shaping you know, here at home. And so I can tell you there's been some very stark differences in the conversation based on year to year year to year yeah right and I guess I would just say too we are meeting you know with our military leaders whenever we're there as well we're just not spending all of our time doing that because we try and break it up so that we we get the information we have a chance to really build that relationship uh, General Miller is there now and we've been through um, a number of, of our of our uh, generals who've been leading the effort but um, our focus is tried to be on really connecting with the women. So I wanted to note 40% uh, of registered Afghan voters are women, and a quarter of the seats in the Afghan parliament are held by women, which is more than the U.S. Congress, we might note. Um, do, you, do you think that, have you seen that making a difference? Because that has happened, evolved, over the period that you visited? Yeah, I think it will. I, you know, I, I think it, it does. Martha mentioned we had a round table with some of the newer parliamentarians the last time we were there. And, and that, you know, you couldn't help but feel really good about the caliber of the women um, who are electing and are choosing um, to be part of, of their country. We, ought, we you know, they're founding mothers to us. I mean, we feel that, that they are at that point for their country, and especially the women that we'd met even, pr you know, pr quite a bit prior to that. I remember the parliamentarian from Herat and, and others. And, um, yes, I, I, we definitely have seen that. But, uh, again, I think, I think there are just some changes that have to occur uh, in Afghanistan yeah. um, to 
be able for them to not only reach their full potential in contributing, but for them them to 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 feel that that they they are in all of this together. And I think that we would certainly say it's not that because we because they're women necessarily. I mean they they are so engaged in so many different areas, but clearly our own American security is dependent on what happens there. And, you know, we, we hear from our colleagues, you know, just get out of there. You know, I mean, there's, there's um, but, but we have to, you know, remember how important it is that, that these women who, who have a great deal to offer um, are, are able to, to um, really be part of this in, in a very, very substantial way. And I think, I think, I think it's, not there yeah, yet. Can but, I just yeah. add on to, I think, I, I know one of the challenges um, that women face in being exercised, being able to exercise their right to vote is security. And it's why it's crucial that we are um, uh, helping with the recruitment and training of women in the Afghan uh, uh, police force. And I'll, I'll just make note, um, as of 2014, there were close to uh, 1,690 female officers in the AMP. Um, as of June uh, of 2019, there's approximately 3,215 women uh, in the ANP. So the numbers are increasing, but as of right now, women only compromise, uh, com women only comprise of 3.2% of the total police force. So when we're talking about women going to uh, the place where they're to cast their vote, it is crucial that we have these uh, women in the security forces there and present uh, so that those women, so that the, so that, um, women will be more inclined to, to go there. So I, yeah. I think that is a very important piece uh, as it relates to the, the number that you uh, said, 40% of women are registered to right. vote. But to exercise. But they have votes. to be in a, right. in a, in a secure uh, way able to exercise their, their right yeah. to vote. And you, you mentioned um, that the conversations that you have very much reflect the policy discussions we're having back here. So you were there in May. Did you hear from the conversations that you had um, ideas on how the peace negotiations might go forward in a way that preserves some of these hard-won gains? What did you hear from folks? We, we did a really interesting training just a few months ago for women negotiators who have been and hopefully will be at the mm -hmm. table. Um, but this is a big concern. You know, how do we not lose I think the gains? <laughs> what you just said is the most important thing is that a woman has to be at the table. <laughs> and, um, and, and what, what I, Susan and I have discussed, and I'll let her jump in, but what we have discussed is how important it is in any uh, peace negotiation that <clears throat> all parties be present at every step of the negotiation, and what we heard on our last trip was, was concerns that that, in fact, was not... Uh, happening, and so I think if we want to ensure that these very, very fragile gains are 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 not only maintained, but we can continue the momentum forward, then not only does do women, Afghan women, need to be at the table, but every person involved that will be affected needs to be at the table every step of the way, and I think that's really important. Yeah, and, and at this point, as you all know, I mean, really, the Afghan government is not at the table, and so that's uh, critical, and, and we know that the hope is that they can reestablish um, the process, uh, I think, waiting till after the election, and uh, you know, is is uh, critical. Although I believe the ambassador um, is planning um, on some meetings relatively soon. But again, I mean, the the government is not really at the table, and so we need to be sure that there is a critical mass uh, of the women, in addition to the men, but that the Afghanis really uh, are there, and we know that that there are reasons why that's just not true right now, and we'll continue to work uh, to be sure that it is. Well, hopefully if the presidential election results are announced soon, uh, right. an opportunity to return yeah. to and, and I think the sad thing that, that we experienced in seeing the disc, uh, how d 
difficult the last election was uh, that the numbers of women participating went down pretty dramatically mm -hmm. uh, from the first time where I recall I think it was about 35 percent of those women who could who could actually vote actually did vote now it, it's quite a bit less and I believe they had women who were were there to um, to go through the searches uh, of the women that had been trained specifically for that not all part of the security but trained for that um, but but clearly people stayed away a lot of precincts were closed and which goes yeah. to the security issue yeah. so it goes back to that but I, you mentioned uh, in passing that both parties are starting to talk about the need to withdraw. Um, how, how does that conversation go for you? you know, you've seen the importance, the difference that our troops are making, the gains that we're safeguarding. Do you, how do you yeah. think that conversation? Sometimes goes? it feels like a voice in the wilderness, right, Martha? Uh, be, because, uh, and we, we understand that uh, a lot of our colleagues have not been involved in this, um, and, and while they are supportive, supportive of, of, of the fact that women must be engaged and that they will be critical to the building of a strong, peaceful civil society. Uh, nevertheless, I think that they, you know, that like, you know, people, people want to bring troops home. And, and I, what, what I don't know now is a result of what's just happened um, in Syria, whether that sort of takes a little of the pressure, maybe, off of Afghanistan. Uh, right now, so I just think it's I think it's vital that that the U.S. Um, remain engaged. I, I just absolutely do. And any opportunity to talk to my colleagues about why that's important, I'm happy to have that conversation. I also will take this opportunity to encourage our colleagues, both in the House and the Senate, who have not been to Afghanistan, to go. Um, it's a lot different talking about something at a 30,000 foot view um, as opposed to actually being in theater with our troops, hearing directly from them about exactly what's going on and why it's important to protect the homeland, to be uh, engaged. And all of the, the sacrifice, mm -hmm. um, both American lives and uh, our allies and Afghan lives as well, um, I think it is vitally important that we uh, remain committed uh, to our presence in Afghanistan. Um, and like I said, I'm happy to have that conversation with anybody, anytime. But I think the <laughs> only way that uh, our colleagues can truly, um, whether they agree with me or not, go. <laughs> go visit. Go be with our folks that mm -hmm. are away from their families, um, sacrificing so much. Meet with uh, Afghan, uh, the Afghan people. Um, and, and I think that people would maybe have their eyes opened a little bit about how important this is. Um, I want to open the floor to questions. Uh, and then we've got <laughs> Microphone. So if we can bring a microphone over here. Uh, Jack ahead. Pagano, COO of Shamshad Radio and Television, Kabul, Afghanistan. We're the number one Pashtun TV station, radio station. There are 20 million Pashtuns in Afghanistan, 30 million Pashtuns in Pakistan. Pashtun Wali is a challenge. As you know what Pashtun Wali is, it's all about the code, the fierce, the loyal of being a Pashtun. And it's all about men. I've had heated discussions and arguments with men about giving women more rights, more opportunities. What's, what's your challenge and try to convince the narrative because it's all about the narrative at the end of the day. We're going to take a few questions and get a mic. Where, where are, here we go, Amanda, right here. Good morning. I'm Phyllis McGrath from the U.S. Afghan Women's Council. And the first thing I want to say is thank you to both of you. You have been an inspiration to those of us in the United States who are trying to partner with the women in Afghanistan. You've been a role model of bipartisan cooperation, and you've been a great source of support to the U.S. Afghan Women's Council, which is in itself quite bipartisan. The two honorary chairs are both Mrs. Bush and Mrs. Clinton, and with Mrs. Ghani from Afghanistan. 
And so um, for my first comment is just a very my, our deepest thanks for all your work. My second question is a little harder. The two of you have really been in the Congress the chief champions for the women in Afghanistan. And I know, sadly, your terms are both um, coming to an end shortly, which is very sad for, for us. But I'm wondering if behind you you see other members in the Congress who may champion this cause as, as times change. Thank you. We were just talking about that beforehand. We're all very sad. Let's take one more question uh, over here. <clears throat> Hi, Mark Farmer with NAFSA Association of International Educators. Uh, I want to first thank Ms. Davis for her um, support of international education um, throughout her career, and she just became a co-sponsor of the Center of Paul Simon Study Abroad Program Act, and so we really appreciate that, so thank you for everything you've done there. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the role of education in preserving women's rights and democracy in Afghanistan and potentially the role of international education broadly within that. Okay, Pashtun Wali, who's coming behind you, education. Either of you want to So tackle? I think probably the, the first question and the third question tie together a little bit in terms of, um, you know, the, the, the role of women, the, um, uh, we've discussed on, on numerous occasions, and again, you know, this is our view, but the importance, we talk about educating uh, young girls uh, but there's an education component to educating young boys as well. And so I think those two things may be tied together in terms of uh, this next generation of Afghan girls and boys and the role that um, each will play in continuing the momentum of moving Afghanistan in the right direction. And so I, I just don't think we can leave out uh, the component of, of not just educating young girls, which is vitally important, <coughs> but also the education of the next generation of, of young boys and men uh, in, in the country. And then to your question, I, I would just say um, thank you um, thank you for giving us the opportunity to to be in this role uh, together. And again, I can't emphasize enough how genuine my relationship, our relationship is with each other. Um, I think there are some opportunities maybe in our last trip together to try to, as Susan was saying earlier, try to recruit um, some members, we have a lot of new members of Congress, a lot of new women, uh, unfortunately not as many on my side of the aisle as Susan's, and we got to work on that. Um, that's a whole nother conversation we could have. Um, but I, I do think it is important because, again, what, what one of the things that pulls at my heart is the consistency of being there and that with Susan mm -hmm. in, in my departure from Congress that uh, we don't want to leave a void there of not uh, being there at the same time every year yep. to continue these relationships. So I know Susan can talk a lot more about the education component. Yeah, uh, one of the uh, uh, comments that a woman made in, in, um, in Kulat was that she knew that times would change in Afghanistan because her son was, re was starting to show true respect for his sister. And she felt that was really different and different from her experience growing <clears throat> up. So that was one of those, those good moments when people on the ground, and I think the amazing thing about Mrs. Ghani actually is that her effort to bring women together, and we, I think it was 65 provinces, is that right? Um, that, that they, in these, the, these peace jurors that they had to get people to talk about what peace means to them. Um, that she has been helping to train women to be conflict resolution champions and to learn how to do that at home, in their communities, in their villages, you know, and, and that that's making a difference because they have those skills, but they don't, I know that was like a lot of women growing up. I mean, I 
grew up quite a few years before Martha did, you know. Uh, it was not as common for women to be called upon to do that. And so they are starting to do more of that. And one of the stories that I heard after uh, all the, these meetings was that men were have actually elected in their group women to be the secretaries, to be the one who, who uh, commented on the discussions that they had, and that they said something like, oh, wow, they're really good. <laughs> they really know what they're talking about. So I think part of it, you know, is exposure. It's that ability for people to see how great they are. Um, you know, and we've been through this in our country as well. I mean, we're still going through this. I, I loved hearing about the two women walking on the moon together, you know. <laughs> um, there have been women walking, <laughs> I mean, walking in space, or, or rather in space, not on the moon, <laughs> but walking, <laughs> walking in space for years. But it's only now, on uh, PBS had this story today, but you know, we, so I, I think that they are moving a whole lot faster than we ever did in, in many ways. But we need, to, we need to be sure that some people know that everybody needs to be exposed to this. And, and they have to have the confidence to be able to stand up and speak out. And it, it's something that has to be learned because um, often women hear just the opposite. Shut up. You know, don't be heard. And do you see people coming behind you? You started this tradition. Absolutely, back in absolutely. And you know, I, I I wish you know in the last few years maybe that we'd been gr having an easier time grooming a, f a few of the women. Um, there's been a lot of interest there, as you know. Members of Congress have busy lives, busy schedules, and and so sometimes even if people have an interest in going, you know, I I've often had people say to me, Oh, I just heard about your trip. Put me on the you know next year I want to go, and I'll go back three months later, and another three months later oh, I've got yeah. Absolutely, and then something comes up, you know, in their district, and they can't do it. But I, I think, especially of the, the new group, we had one of the newer members, uh, the new members, freshman, um, was with us on the last trip, and she's on Armed Services Committee, and so I, I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful. And we've been talking to folks, and, and I think that there'll be an interest. My, my hope is with Martha that maybe they'll allow us to take a few more women this time, and that we'll, we'll have a chance to expose. Uh, so it was more of them. I gotta, yeah. t I gotta say this. So my kids say every year, "Mom, why do you always go to Afghanistan at Mother's Day?" And I'm like, "What's well, my day? I can go wherever I want." <laughs> <laughs> so I try to tell my colleagues, and it's not always on. You know, obviously we can't tell when we're there, but um, it's not. It's always on or around. I'm like, we can do the big lunch another day, um, but it's really important. Uh, to, to send that message to <laughs> our colleagues too. It's your day. You can go where you want. <laughs> so I, I want to um, ask a last, a last uh, question from for both of you, but this is submitted from students at Chelsea High School in Alabama where we have one of our USIP peace teachers, uh, a wonderful teacher named Ryan Adams. And these students asked, considering that we've had both Republican and Democratic presidents since 2001, how important has bipartisanship been as a factor for the improvement of women, Af of Afghan women up to this point? So, any so I don't know if they're watching, so <laughs> greetings to my friends in Alabama, if they are. But um, look, I mean, it's, it's why I said what I said when I stood at the podium talking about my relationship with Susan, and, and it's, it's, it's not just important for Afghanistan and for uh, the role of women in, in improving um, um, the situation for women in Afghanistan. Um, I, the, there's, you know, we've said so many times um, the, the way women are treated and, and held in regard in Afghanistan demonstrates the strength of the country itself. I mean, it's vitally important that women are um, are given these opportunities, and there's so many women that are sacrificing so much to continue to move the ball down the field. But bipartisanship is not just important as it relates to U.S.-Afghan policy. Um, it, it is important, and I think our our relationship in returning year after year together 
um, demonstrates how important that is. So when it comes time to writing the National Defense Authorization Act and needing to fence off funds or create more flexibility in how this money is used or even through the appropriations process, um, uh, being able to have these conversations and shared experiences does in turn put us in a better position to get good policy uh, on the books. But I'll just say in terms of bipartisanship overall, I mean, look, it is, it is an interesting time and um, there is a lot of divisiveness um, throughout our country right now. And one of the things that I tell folks at home when I'm traveling through my district is, is what I said to you this morning, I want you to be encouraged because these relationships are real and they exist and they're never gonna be reported on, ever. <laughs> Except for here today. <laughs> right, here today. But, but, but it's real and it's, yeah. and it's important and it's, it's not just important to our, our foreign policy, it's important to our domestic policy as well, that we know each other and are working together and hearing each other. Yeah. Yeah, I thought I would just, just quickly cite an example because Martha is much more involved in this now than I am. Um, but it, you may know there's a women's softball team. And rather than playing, you know, Democratic women playing Republican women, um, they join together and play play the press, which is... <laughs> hmm. We're on average 25 enemy. years younger than us, okay? <laughs> right. But, but, but it's funny because even in, in this book, I mean, there, there's, a, there's as, as I was finding what, where, where Martha was in the book, I mean, and they're talking about it. I mean, and that's significant. I mean, it sends a strong message. And again, I have, I, I have, we both have friends on both sides of the aisle, and I know that the men are engaged in a very different way with one another, but I'm always impressed by what they're doing together as well. It, it, it is a shame that those stories don't come out, but I would agree with Martha. Um, it is a struggle today to do things sort of hand in hand from the beginning uh, in a bipartisan way. It's really tough. And, and part of that, you know, has to do with um, to, sometimes there is a different, difference in perspective and a fear that somehow, you know, if we don't write the bill ourselves, that somehow, you know, it's going to be diminished. And mm. I, you know, it, it is what it is. Um, I have to say, I mean, I think there are some obvious reasons today um, while we're having some of these problems, and, and I regret <clears throat> that. Uh, I don't, sometimes it's, it's hard to get around it, but, but I do think we all have to do our part. And I think in, in conversations, I remind my call and my, my constituents all the time, you know, whatever you can do at work, in your neighborhood, to talk to somebody who doesn't necessarily see eye to eye with you. Take that time because in the end, you'll probably discover that if you've got a bunch of note cards, you know, on different subjects, you probably could put a lot of them in the we agree pile, but then, you know, there's some that you don't agree on. And, and you've got to work through that. Every bloody has to play a role in this. And if, you know, if we all stay in our, you know, little uh, huts, uh, <laughs> we're never going to break through this. And so it's important for all of us. And, and it's great to have those examples and those friends. Uh, who are willing to do that. Well, I want to thank both of you for joining us. We will continue to try to hold that bipartisan space through these bipartisan congressional dialogues and shine a light on the extraordinary partnerships and important work that happens. Um, I, I think on behalf of everyone in the room, we thank you for your commitment uh, to the issues in Afghanistan, particularly for being such important champions for the women of Afghanistan, it's made an extraordinary difference. Um, I echo the sadness that you're both retiring. Um, we will miss you greatly, and uh, let us know if we can help you recruit uh, folks who will continue right. your Mother's Day tradition, mm -hmm. which is just really a, a... And I would just say there are lots of other ways to be involved um, with Afghanistan rather than being in the Congress, so... <laughs> there you go. You heard it here. You heard it here. Please join me in thanking two exceptional members of Congress. Thank you. Thanks so much. This is great. Yeah.